didn't see anyone alive for over a year. My dad told us he can't leave the valley. As long as we stay here, we'd be protected. It's crazy. This is still here. Why are you doing the work by hand? Can't drive this? Ran out of gas. Pumps don't run without electricity. Oh, well, you can get it to work manually. Hey! It worked! It really means something that you think in long term for us. I want things to be good between us. It's okay, because we've got time. <laughs> I mean you no harm, ma'am. My name's Caleb. Ah! Hey! No, 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 it's all right. This guy could be anybody for all we know. This valley will survive like you and I did because we have faith. So what's your plan? <laughs> stuff about you. I was sick of being on my own. Jealousy doesn't see you, sir. I love you. You fancy a wager? Hey, guys. Hi there. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I told you before, and I want to tell everybody here, I love this film. I was so excited to be watching it. As soon as I started it, I felt like I was in the hands of a really great filmmaker. And then you guys showed up on screen, and I'm in the hands of a great filmmaker and phenomenal actors. So thank you for a great experience. Thank you very much. Um, but I, I, I kind of want to go back to the be beginning with this, because this is a loose adaptation of what many have described as a sort of teen science fiction post-apocalypse book, right? Or his one adult novel. He used to write children's books. Where did you come in, and, and what, were your, what was your take on, on, on adapting this story? <clears throat> well, you know, the story is essentially, it's a, it's a post-apocalyptic story, but it's more in the sense of it being a day-after kind of story. Like, I was very, always as, growing up, I loved, like, the kind of 80s post-apocalyptic movies, which were always kind of, like, one person left after everything is gone. And that's what was attractive to me about it, that it wasn't kind of doing like big giant wide shots of like, you know, destruction and havoc and a bunch of zombies running at you, but that it was this other kind of thing that I remembered and thought that there were really cool uh, stuff to still explore about that universe. Well, yeah, most um, of the time when we see post-apocalyptic movies, it is the sort of action of the apocalypse. It's the, it's the sort of physical fight over the resources that are left. I don't want to take anything away from Mad Max. It's amazing. But those, that's generally what we see with this. It's a much more emotional fight between just the people that are left, right? Yeah, I guess that was what uh, was attractive initially to me was that it was about, you know, dealing with... It was both about, like, dealing with being alone and like what it's like to actually be alone and being, and then dealing with relationships on a very basic level, like a relationship with one other person, not necessarily like romantic or physical relationship even, but just like having to deal with yourself by yourself versus yourself with another person, then adding in romance and then adding in another person and it kind of becoming this like, you know, like sort of the root of like, a lot of conflict I think we all have, I guess. It's almost an arranged relationship at the beginning of the movie for, the, for you and Margot's character because you have to make it work. You're the only two that you know are left. So it's either be alone or understand and get to know and like this person. Yeah, that's the, that's the initial challenge, you know, for Loomis is that uh, uh, of trying to figure out a way of making sure that you don't end up in a bad relationship with the last woman on the planet, you know, which, is, which would suck, you know. <laughs> I mean, that would, you know, that would be tricky, you know. And so he's sort of in a mindset of, uh, of trying to take it slowly, of trying to figure it out, of trying to build a kind of a friendship that could maybe find its way into a relationship, could find its way into a sort of building block. 
Uh, and of course, all of this is blasted out of, and all of that kind of cerebral thinking is blasted out of the water by the arrival of Captain Kirk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> leave, it, leave, leave it to fucking Captain Kirk to ruin everything. <laughs> um, talk about working with, 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 with Margot on this. This is a, a silly thing to say, but I, I was reading a piece about her recently in, I think, Elle magazine or something. Why I was reading Elle magazine, I don't have to justify. Uh, but they, they kept referencing how she never looks her age. She always just looks a couple of years older than the stunning 23 that she is. And this is the first movie where I saw where she looks 23. She looks like a kid lost at a farm and then surrounded by these adult men. I know in the original book, it's, she's, she's a teenager, right? In this, she's not. But she does look much younger than these men, which adds to the sort of complexity of this relationship, especially for your character, where I feel like it's a bit of an emotional mentorship as well as kind of like having a relationship with her. Well, yeah, I mean, because he's, I mean, he's a scientist. He's, um, you know, he, he, has a, he has a very specific skill set. So he's able to kind of guide her in the kind of... In the, in the um, in the more technological way of, uh, of of surviving this, she's a very rural girl, and I guess there is something then that is slightly paternalistic about their their, their relationship, um, and uh, and perhaps that's one of the things that slows down the kind of desire to rush into something much more front-footed, much more kind of uh, engaged. And actually, when the the arrival of Caleb means that here's a man who. Uh, who doesn't have all this technological kind of sophistication, but what he is is incredibly front-footed and uh, and capable of uh, of really wanting to engage with life and engage with her, and you know, in a way that he's not necessarily thinking about quite as much as um, as Loomis is. And obviously, then that challenges Loomis to do something about it. And obviously, they then get into a slightly uh, testosterone-fueled complication. Well, it also plays into the sort of faith versus logic aspect of the film as well, where she's more faith-based, you are a bit more logic-based. Her father was more faith-based. So it is this, again, it plays into, like you said, the paternalistic side of, the two char of your character with her. Yeah, he's certainly an, uh, an atheist, you know, and, uh, and, and so he arrives... How could you not be? It's a post-nuclear uh, war. Well, exactly. <laughs> you know, well, this is what he's thinking when he you know, meets her, and she's very sort of religious, religious minded. And, um, uh, and in a sense, initially, that's like so many other things in the, in, the, in the film, it's irrelevant what she thinks. And it's irrelevant how he sees faith, you know, because there's just two of them. And it's irrelevant, say, for example, what race they are. You know, it's just two of them. So it, none, of the, none of these things matter until Caleb arrives, you know. And then, it's, uh, then there's a, min a minoritization. And, and that creates a whole other psychological conflict, especially for Loomis, who finds himself in the minority both in terms of religion and in terms of race, and, uh, and therefore creates a kind of self-consciousness, you know, which, uh, which didn't exist before in that kind of, in their, in their kind of, in their duality, you know. When highlighting that minoritization uh, of Loomis, you don't really lay a heavy hand on it. It's brought up slightly, it's discussed here and there, but it's not something that I feel like most filmmakers or storytellers would really want to press. You didn't do that. Did you have moments where you, you sort of struggled with how much to bring it up, how much to talk about it? Did you shoot more stuff that you then took out because you realized you didn't need as much of it? I, I kind of always felt like we sort of knew where that should sit, which was that it shouldn't be... A heavy hand of that stuff, I guess it was you know I f I f we kind of we certainly discussed it, I think, and like I, but I felt like in in making the film that was never it was never a, a matter of like we've gone too far, really like it was always we always kind of knew that maybe uh, audiences are really smart and they add a lot of stuff to things anyway and <clears throat> and there would be all sorts of other you know, thoughts that you'd be having during the course of watching a film anyway. So I didn't ever feel like there was a need to kind of like whack any of that stuff over the head too hard. I mean, it's interesting you bring up that there is certainly like, I would definitely agree that like Loomis is an atheist and, you know, sh she has religion, but I, I don't see the movie as really like turning on that even. It's more like they're different, y you know, and it's like they're two different. Th th this is, this happens, you know, all the time we meet people who have like these kind of fundamental differences and we either like learn how to like move past them or not and, and I mean I, I always felt like the point should be that not necessarily that you walk away with it with some big debate about science but more kind of like noticing that those differences are how you have what creates conflict.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you when you were developing this film, how did you go about casting? How did you cast these three people together? Was it about making sure that you'd have three people who got along as they were the only actors on set the whole time? No, I think it was like make sure that there was, you know, people that all were down to do something. It's not the easiest thing in the world to like be in a two-hander, like a literal two-hander, which is what the movie is for a good portion of it between Chutel and Margot, and then a three-hander when, you know, Chris shows up. So um, it was just a matter of, you know, like all of us wanting to kind of do that and, and get to play like that. Is that nerve-wracking to be in a two-hander? Because, I, I, you know, I went into watching it thinking that it might be for an actor, but then as I watch it, you guys are so confident and you carry the movie so effortlessly, I started thinking to myself, oh, maybe it might be easier for the actor because he doesn't have to worry about what other people are doing that often or how other people are guiding the story along. It's just what they're doing that's guiding it. Uh, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think there's a lot of emotional honesty that has to happen in the film because you know that if you're just the two characters for so much of it, you know, that, uh, that it's your truthfulness and your kind of... Uh, uh, the truthfulness of the emotional interaction that is really carrying the narrative. So there's nothing to hide behind, you know, uh, which means that we had to be very specific and kind of meticulous. And, uh, and we talked uh, at length about every every scene and every every moment and we played it in different ways and we tried to find uh, the real the real truth of every of every of every beat uh, which is you know which was something that I know that Margot really enjoyed you know because I don't know I mean she's obviously in her work been uh, she's a terrific actress but it's that kind of what she was bringing here was a real kind of raw emotional intelligence that I don't know if in some of our other work she's been able to give you know so I know that she really enjoyed that, as did I, as did Chris, you know. So, um, so that kind of detail, although not daunting, was exciting, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and we knew that, that the sort of heavy reliance on just the sort of dialogue and just the nuance of character um, was, uh, um, was going to be uh, just a, a, a major part of the film. Was the film brought to you uh, following 12 Years a Slave, following finishing that film? Uh... <laughs> I think we were done shooting. I think we were done shooting, yeah. So it was after we after I shot Twelve Years, and then we met, and uh, and then we started shooting like a year later or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, tw Twelve Years. Uh, I remember when I talked to you before. It was a slightly uh, sort of ex exhausting experience. It, it, it was it was pretty exhausting. Uh, were you worried about going into doing uh, something like this, where you're, you know, like you said, a two hander after doing something like Twelve Years a Slave? No, I was really excited. I, I mean, I feel like, the, you know, it's such a kind of, it's sort of a very different approach to film. And uh, I've been excited and interested in doing a, a two-hander or a three-hander for ages. You know, I just thought there was something amazing about just having a film where there was nothing else really going on, just interpersonal relationships. And that's still having a strong, dramatic arc and drive and, you know, the tension is ratcheted up in an incredible way. Um, and uh, and you can do that with just a couple of people, and, and without any, you know, like Craig was saying, there's no zombies chasing us. You know, it's like it's all in the, it's all in their relationship, it's all in their dynamics, and that's uh, and that's really, I think that's really great. It's great to play, you know. Craig, uh, this is your third feature. Uh, do you feel like you've kind of been honing different skills that have led you through and to each 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 film? I, maybe not consciously on the top, <laughs> but yeah, I think so. Yeah, this was certainly like. <clears throat> my last film was was uh, also not a whole like very large cast either. Um, compliance, compliance, which means, I think is on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Go watch it. Sorry, it it, uh, it, <laughs> it seems so it, blase. A lot I really of it like takes it. place in kind of one location, but it's one room almost. So, so uh, not to downsell the movie. <laughs> it's <laughs> you, but, uh, you're downselling it, and I'm blase like telling people to watch it. <laughs> Um, but but like one thing that I was excited to do in, in Z for Zechariah was shoot something that was a beautiful movie, like f photographically, and like yeah. concentrate on that, and like try to like make something that like was was beautiful, and and uh, and I, all of the team really worked real hard to try to like do that, and we went to we shot the film in New Zealand, um, partially just kind of to to add to that too. So hopefully that. I oh yeah, it's it's something. it's gorgeously shot, and it's shot by Tim Moore, right? Who yeah. shot with David Gordon Green for a while. Did you? Um, I imagine that when you're shooting with Tim Moore, you can kind of be like, "We're going to stay here. You go get amazing B-roll of the woods and flowers," because every like every movie he does, he just has this incredible these incredible uh, like lyrical shots of the outdoors. He just seems so attuned in tune with that. 
Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, he's really, he is really in tune with that. And he, he knows, yeah, he knows what, it, he's like real smart about kind of like knowing where the sun is and how to like, he's a pro, <laughs> is what he is. He's a professional. <laughs> Uh, talk about talk about working with 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 Margot. I uh, mentioned her age, but she is so stunning and incredible in the film. Her performance is it's subtle and like you said, it's raw. But at times, she's just doing very little little things with you when she's like understanding who you are and getting to know your character. And she's 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 great. Can you talk a little bit about working with her? Yeah, it was a blast. I mean, she she really was great, and she was down to um, you know. When I talked to her about doing this, it was, you know, Wolf of Wall Street had kind of just come out. And I was like, this would be like, we should not make, you know, like it should be the other direction of that as much as we can do. Because like that doesn't really, I don't think that'll play. You know, like you being a stunning <laughs> <you> bombshell <laughs> okay. won't necessarily work in this like dynamic. Like I don't think you, and she, but she, you know, she, she got the, instinctively, I think that's what she was excited about, about the role. And like Chutel said, like, about being able to to kind of do some of this type of work, which she hadn't really gotten a chance to do, at least not like in a big stage like before. So, yeah, it was great. It was great. I mean, we we were exploring stuff almost every every day. It wasn't necessarily like we wouldn't. It wasn't a thing where we would shoot the scene and then kind of like have it and put it in the bag. If we had ideas, we would try to, you know. It Play doesn't. It. it doesn't feel that way because I imagine like uh, what was what was your uh, your your shooting schedule? How long were you shooting for? Uh, I think we had like twenty seven days. And it doesn't feel like one of those kind of rushed dialogue heavy shoots. It feels like you're actually working to find the best way to tell the story through glances, through the meaning of the way people walk around each other and look at each other, rather than just sort of overwriting or going through it with with words. Was that something that you guys found while you were doing scenes together? That we would what? Sorry, I, sort of like mo sort of uh, losing words, losing bits of dialogue, and working on how to do the scene where you were just sort of dealing with glances and the meaning of, yeah, of body language. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, we were. It, it was, I mean, suppose we were just sort of utilizing all the book, you know, that all the, the sort of the acting book. We were improvising at times. We were just trying to do it, uh, cutting down the dialogue. We were doing sort of. We were adding bits. You know, we were. You know, it was whatever worked. It was really just sort of scene to scene to sort of keep the, the narrative like just moving forward and to to keep the tension. Uh, high, you know, so um, it needed all of that kind of manipulation and uh, and skill set really to um, uh, just to kind of keep it as as honest and dramatic as we could. Is that a rarity uh, as an actor that you get to work with a director and your other cast members like that? Sort of really work out and pull the layers out of the scene as much as you can. It is rare. I mean, but that's what I think is the thing about just having a very limited cast. You know, two people, three people, is that you kind of need to do that. You need to have, a, you need to just be able to tease out all the nuance. And it was, and it was actually kind of great to be in New Zealand, which is pretty. We were on the South Island of New Zealand. It's beautiful. It's really remote, you know, and uh, and we were and we were pretty unplugged in the end. And so, you know, you had to walk like half a mile to get to this box, and two feet from the box, if you turned a little bit to the left. You got one bar on your cell phone, you know, and it was so it's kind of it's out there, you know, and so it kind of gave us the freedom, I think, just to really kind of start to embrace this landscape and to be able to work together in that kind of concentrated in that concentrated way. Uh, when I told some people that you were coming on, Craig, some people were like the creator of Homestar Runner is coming on. So I don't know if people know what Homestar Runner is, but how does the creator of Homestar Runner go from that to this? Well, and uh, to be fair, like I my truly like best childhood friends and I like made it up with the Chapman brothers Mike and Matt Chapman brothers chaps are the are the are the true you know sword bearers of Homestar um I'm like the fifth beetle <laughs> of that but um but yeah we I, I mean I essentially at some point was kind of like I I didn't have enough patience to really be an animator <laughs> I wanted to like keep wor working on on movies, and so I, I went and I came to New York, and I like worked in film here, and and um, but I still talk to those guys every almost you know every did, day. Did that so. help you shape any of the tools for for your films though? Work doing a little bit of animating, storytelling at all, even in that minor scale. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that you know Mike and Matt would probably say like, you know, we just do it funny and makes us what we like you know which is 
is always a good tool to learn, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, make sure that you like it and you're not doing it for some other reason, you know? So, yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit, I mean, we talked about New Zealand, we're talking about working with the actors. Can you talk about actually creating the idea of what this post-apocalyptic world would look like? We see mo glances of it at the beginning, and then we kind of stick to this farm, but it still lingers in the background somehow. How, what, what, what were you thinking when you were going into how to build that around, uh, around the story? Yeah, well, I always knew, we shot the stuff that is in the post-apocalyptic side of the thing, uh, in, of the, like, the other hills, the other valleys in West Virginia, um, which I had spent some time in uh, on another project that kind of never fully went, w happened or hasn't yet, um, years ago, and just, like, new kind of looked very distinct and very... It has a. It feels moody, but it doesn't feel like the crumbling buildings kind of visual that I feel like is the obvious first choice off the rack for that. You know. So. But even uh, Chuotel's car or the cart that he that he kind of has, like it it's it's out of place. It's interesting. It could be futuristic. It could be something else. Where you know it, it's definitely not of the current yeah. world. Where did you get the idea for that? Yeah, well, I think that, like, Chuta, you know, probably, I think John Loomis came from some sort of military research thing where there would be maybe, you know, prototypes of of things. I mean, that was kind of where all of the design of his stuff came from, the concept that maybe it was out of, like, the DARPA research lab or, or something like that, that it was, he happened to be near stuff stuff that, is a few years in the future, but not necessarily crazy in the future, you know? Absolutely. I think we have some time for audience questions. Do we have some questions out here, right here? Um, hello, Chuatel, Craig, and of course, Ricky. What's up? Um, Chuatel, you were a member of National Youth Theater in London, and I have a two-part question for you. Can you share a little bit of your experiences there and also um, do you actors get sort of preference or advantage and what overall role theater plays in your career and in careers of other actors? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was at the, uh, thank you, I, I was at the National Youth Theatre, uh, which was a, a great place to start and to kind of start uh, to work in theater, it's essentially a semi-professional, for, uh, for those who don't know, it's a semi-professional theater company just for young people uh, between the ages of about 14 to uh, 18, 17, 18. Uh, and, uh, and you do shows throughout the summer. So you do shows in, but in large theaters, you know, the houses of about 800 to 1,000 people, you know, in some, of, some biggish theaters in, 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 in London. Uh, as well as they set up summer courses for some of the younger guys and so on. And anyway, I was with them for three, four years, and, uh, and did uh, numerous shows in the, uh, with them, and that's uh, essentially how I started as an actor. And, you know, people from Daniel Day-Lewis, Helen Mirren, Daniel Craig, so on, uh, all went through the, uh, the National Youth Theatre. It's a great institution. I think, uh, uh, in answer to your second question, if I understand that, the, that uh, I think theatre is, is, is really vital for an actor. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm in a play... <laughs> right now in London uh, that's in repertory, so uh, there's another show that comes in. Uh, so I'm just bunked off, you know. Uh, so, um, uh, and You're I, in a play right now? Right, yeah, yeah. So what's, what's your it's schedule? Like? Every did Man you, and It's Great. You did you like it. fly yeah. in today or doing this and flying back and uh, going uh, to do... No, I, I, the, the play's done in repertory with another oh. play. Okay. So, so occasionally I get about like a week off or something. Got you. Whilst they do the show and actually they have a show going into tech that's coming into things. So I actually got two weeks off. So I go back for the end of, uh, end of August to finish the show. So it's, uh, it's almost done. But I've been doing it the whole summer and... Uh, and uh, it's just one of the things that I you know, attempted. I all, I mean, it's a very important part of my working life is to be on stage. I learn a lot doing stage work um, uh, that you can't quite find all the time if you are constantly doing film. Uh, but I always feel that I can apply some of the stuff that I learn, you know, into into film quite well. So uh, I enjoy doing, you know, across medium. Does theater work help you, kind of? Uh know how to do the same thing again and again like if you get on a film set and you have to do five takes of the same emotion or the same tick you kind of have an idea as to how you can replicate it over and over again because in theater you're kind of practicing something and then doing it 
every night every night in the week for yeah. like five months, two it's months? It's so interesting, that question, because I found that I, that, that and maybe it's because of the film work that I'm doing, that that is exactly what I don't want to do on stage. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to replicate anything, you know? It's just, it's... Uh, uh, which is really like a strong challenge in theater is just not to get on having done the show like what 60 something times 60 70 times it's just to go on and just sort of just let the show sort of run itself and you know hit the mark and do the thing but actually to be engaged with it and to be to change it to be brave enough to sometimes not get the laugh where you used to get the laugh because you decided to do it in a completely different or you know within reason not to freak anybody out who's on stage with you but you know to do it to try and do it differently uh, that's also the same thing in, uh, in, in film, I think. I think the first take is so vital, you know, because everything else, you don't know anything in the first take, and that's why I think it's such a raw and important uh, take. And then everything else is trying to sort of duplicate what you did in the, or some variation of what, you've already, of what you've already done. So in that way, the same sort of discipline applies, that you're trying to, uh, to never do it the same, the same way twice. In fact, that's what we were... We did talk about that a lot of just of playing scenes in very different ways, you know. It's like, um, but and you know, in a way that you know, there's less risk in that, in the sense of uh, you can just sort of, you know, it, it can all go to the editor essentially, which is not what can happen in th in theatre, obviously. But um, uh, but really trying to find truth, but through different playing mechanisms. Uh, you know. Was the need to, or the knowledge, knowing that you had to play it in several different ways for this, or that you should play it in several different ways going into the edit, was that something that you learned on, on compliance? Because that is such a tricky film, tonally, to, to get right. It's, yeah, it's totally, it's totally something that I like. It was why I wanted to do this, because I, I had so much fun. I kind of stumbled into doing that essentially saying, great, I think we got it, now do it wrong. Do another take and just do something else. Let's just see what else there is that we're not thinking about. It was so fun on kind of in the end of compliance that um, being able to do it with, ju you know, with just three people um, was the, the attraction in a way. How often do you find that what you thought was wrong is actually going to be right or is right for the edit? I'd say fifty percent of the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's wrong, <laughs> but that's okay. Like, I mean, the truth is, it's like, yeah, it's 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 worthwhile to explore the different versions, and then at least you know that you kind of did do it right. You know, that you didn't leave anything on the table or anything like that. And, and I would just say, like, the other thing about it, and <clears throat> you know, certainly it's like s such a pleasure to just be able to like make movies for a living and, and as a as a job it's like very rewarding just to get to say that that's your job but it's really fun to do to to work like this or at least it was to me like i i had a lot of it like made it such a pleasure to like actually go on set and shoot and i, I mean i felt like it felt like a fun crew and a fun shoot because Absolutely. of that yeah. uh we have another question here hey um Hey, this question is for uh, Chiwetel. Uh, my question is, are you picky about the roles you choose? And also, um, what movies in the future are you aspiring to do? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's, um, I think I am quite picky, you know, in, in, in roles and, uh, and quite s sort of selective and, uh, 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 and, um, I, I always have been. It's not something that I. It's not something that I'm sort of developing. It's like it's something that I've, I've that's always been in me. That parts and and um, and the productions just sort of need to inspire me in some way or engage me in some way. It's hard to even describe or know. It's sort of a sort of intangible quality that sort of needs to happen when you read a script. And it may not even be that the script is complete or that. Uh, is is not doesn't need any more work or you know so on. It can be in a kind of a sort of disarray, but it still communicates something. And uh, and uh, and obviously meeting people like meeting Craig and talking about the movie and seeing where his kind of his vision for the film was going is a very important part of uh, of uh, of coming on board. And then uh, and then sometimes it is just you know the, uh, the the you know the last the last piece of the puzzle can be you know other people you know, who are doing the film, what parts they're doing, you know what I mean? Just like trying to sort of figure out how it's going to sort of feel and whether it feels right and whether you can get inside it somehow. Uh, and, um, and, and that, 
that encourages me to go ahead and, and try and make the film. And, and, you know, you're allowed to be wrong and make not great films, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And you've got to give yourself the leeway to do that as well. Uh, but those are sort of overall the kind of things that, uh, that I think about. And I suppose going forward, that's what I want to carry on trying to do and uh, in very different films and very different uh, uh, mediums. You're, uh, you're playing the villain in the Doctor Strange movie coming up, right? Uh, I'm, I, I'm playing Baron Mordor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that, I, I don't know if that's a spoiler, that that's the villain. <laughs> I'm neither do I. Wiki so, yeah. Wikipedia <laughs> said it was. Um, were you nervous? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Can't say much about Marvel movies. Uh, were you nervous going into that? Were you nervous uh, choosing, choosing that as a, as a big project to do? Uh, not really. I'm excited about it, actually. Very excited by it. And, I, and, I, you know, and it's uh, a great opportunity for, to, you know, to work with a very good friend of mine, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. And, uh, and to, for us to kind of bounce off each other is going to be a lot of fun. And I think, uh, and also an actress that I don't know, I mean, I don't know her personally very well, but I'm a huge, huge fan of hers. It's Tilda Swinton. And so uh, uh, I think the, uh, the three of us hopefully will create something exciting. Absolutely. Uh, next question from the audience. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I have a quick question for Chiwetel. Um, how would you um, elaborate on preparation for a role such as like a Huey Lucas versus like a Solomon Norfolk, like the pretty much from a secondary role to like a primary role? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Huey Lucas was, uh, I actually, in a strange way, I mean, I, in a strange way, they, they weren't, it wasn't a dissimilar approach actually to, uh, to doing uh, to doing Huey and then to Solomon. In, in, that, I, in both instances, I was, just, I was kind of uncovering parts of their past. I remember going to Carolina, South Carolina, you know, just, uh, on, a, just on a pure research trip about, about Huey and that whole kind of um, and the Frank Lucas empire and where it came from and just trying to find out, um, you know, where they were raised and, you know, <clears throat> um, uh, and just trying to sort of sit with him for a while. It was kind of, it was an interesting beginning to all of that journey. Uh, of course, with uh, Solomon Northup, it was much easier to, um, you know, because he had a first-hand historical document and a complete account of his life and his experiences. So really just kind of delving into that and, uh, and figuring that out and then going to the plantations that he talked about, you know. But there was something in both of them that... Um, that was very strongly geographical, essentially, which is not always the way that I work. I don't necessarily need to go to the place where the people are, but, uh, but in, those, in those instances, the two examples you mentioned, uh, that, that's how I approached it. I think we have time for one more question. Um, first of all, thank you for your work. You're amazing. I, I'm a fan. Thank you. Um, question for you. Uh, so it was mentioned before that you were in 12 Years of Slave. Um, can you talk about your experience on set, specifically with uh, Stephen McQueen? Yeah, um, uh, it, it was an incredible experience. You know, uh, Steve is, a, is a, an amazing um, uh, visual director and very kind of, um, you know, he's the sort of guy that is, is capable of articulating the need for, you know, 100%, you know what I mean? And, uh, uh, and obviously, whenever you go into a project, whenever you're working on anything, you want to do that. You want to give 100% to anything. What, what else would be the point of doing it? But it's interesting to be around somebody who articulates that and articulates it for himself as well as for, any, for everybody else. You know, uh, it's, uh, there are kind of gentler ways to arrive at certain things, I suppose, but I, but I, but I actually kind of loved Steve's you know, muscular uh, directness. And um, uh, so I, it was, it was uh, a fascinating time. Craig, how can people see Z for Zachariah next week, right? Comes out next week, August 28th. August 28th, guys. Go see Z for Zachariah. It's a phenomenal film, one of the best you'll see this summer. Guys, thank you so much for being here.